Welcome to Building Bridges, the program committee to supporting the women and men of the New York City Police Department. Back with me again is Dr. Falkoff, the president and founder of the America's Chapter for the Foundation for a Drug-Free World. We're going to continue where we left off um, from the last program. Uh, there are some things we still want to discuss. And um, Doctor, uh, where we, we left off on uh, the uh, issue with marijuana? Was we actually left off on vaping. Oh, with the vaping. And the nicotine. The nicotine is in the vaping. That's right. Yes. Yeah. People don't know that. No, so that's, that's where we left off. So, you know, I want you to continue from there. Okay. But first, what I wanted to do is just wish all of you watching this show that Happy New Year 2021. And, um, you know, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Joe. And Feelings mutual. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. And uh, so let's go on. So we talked about vaping and how it's become very prominent in usage by young teenagers, young adults in general. And mm. what's happened besides the vaping and the flavorings, with flavorings themselves being toxic, then we went into the nicotine. And the fact that the nicotine was in these materials, even though on the ingredients it said no nicotine, uh, but it was in the bottles. It was very amazing to see that. And so we have that factor of the nicotine causing addiction. Mm -hmm. If that wasn't enough already, now let's add on vaping of marijuana. We know that marijuana at a low THC level causes different effects to the mind development in young teenagers, brain development, preterm low birth weight babies, uh, effects on the mother, effects on the newborn child. But those are with uh, small effects of 15, uh, small proportion of 15 to 25 percent. Now let's talk about with vaping. Vaping actually increases the marijuana use uh, because the THC level goes up. And so the THC level going up to about 85 to 90 percent THC. Is that wow. amazing? Amazing, yes. Let me ask you a question. The vaping and the marijuana, Yes. does that have any impact on a person developing dementia? Well, you, you know what? Let's talk about some actual results of the National Institute of Health from a Dr. Nora Volkov, who actually is the one in charge of uh, researching marijuana. And what Dr. Volkov actually has stated is number one, is that the marijuana and the high THC levels is causing effect on general brain development in young uh, adults. Wow. Yeah. So now you have the <clears throat> brains are being affected. Then you also have the second factor besides the physical factor. That's the mental factor that when someone's on marijuana, they really are, are not there. So they're in a classroom, but they don't hear what the teacher's saying. Of course, obviously they hear the sounds, but do they actually then put that together and integrate it into something that they're going to use as a skill, as a teacher, as a dentist as I am, as a, you know an attorney? Obviously not, because they're not coherent. So now you have that effect of the marijuana. Uh, and then you have the, the other effects of the marijuana, which are now being uh, recently uh, shown. The marijuana and the THC actually has effects on the heart and on different organs of the body. Wow. And so the marijuana, obviously, with that THC level being so high with the vaping, uh, definitely is something that's being studied, in fact, in terms of your question, in terms of what happens with uh, elderly or the elderly mm -hmm. with dementia. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Can you make a comparison um, on a person who's intoxicated with alcohol as compared to using excessive marijuana, the, the, the level of intoxication. Can you compare the, the, the two of them and, and, and the effects it has on, on what they do and say? Sure. Well, let's take a look at something that's very important to realize, and that's that marijuana usage has been shown in many recent scientific studies to actually gateway to opioid usage, which is something that actually a lot of people thought would be the reverse years ago, that it would be more or less like a harmless 
drug mm -hmm. uh, with no mm. other effects. But the fact of the matter is, is that the marijuana, as any other drug, has been shown to be leading to increased opioid use. Let's get, take an example. In California, uh, where prescription uh, drugs were reduced because as a profession, in the health professions, it was mandated to decrease the amount of prescribing that was done in California by health professionals. So you would think that opioid death rate, heroin death rate, should decrease. Makes sense, right? Right. But the actual statistics showed that they increased. And what was interesting is that in California, obviously, you have marijuana usage. So now you have the marijuana usage, and it's counteracting the professional decrease in prescribing because now we have this marijuana out in the lay public and it's being utilized. You know, recently, uh, New Jersey legalized marijuana, recreational marijuana. Mm -hmm. So you have to wonder with the studies that have come out showing that the marijuana usage and even the medical marijuana usage is leading to opioid increases in the wow. states, that what, what are we actually doing then? You see, and that, that wasn't the case uh, with alcohol, because alcohol has been around a long time. Obviously, we don't want people to be intoxicated, mm -hmm. committing crimes mm -hmm. on alcohol, all the things you know as a policeman. But, I mean, you know, the, 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 the increases that we've seen recently is what's really, you know, something of concern to me. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and I know when I, was on, when I was on patrol, mm -hmm. uh, whether a person was intoxicated from alcohol or excessive use of marijuana, you just couldn't deal with them. Mm -hmm. It was impossible. Uh, their state of mind was altered to the point that uh, it was impossible to deal with them. And you know, you know what's a shame, too? These young kids today that are introduced to marijuana, mm -hmm. the person that introduces them to the marijuana gives them the impression, it's only temporary, don't worry, it's, you're not going to get addicted to exactly. it, you know? Yeah. And if you read all this, uh, these booklets that yes. you have that the foundation has put out, and if you go on the website mm -hmm. and you look at the, at the videos that mm -hmm. the website has, mm -hmm. that opens your eyes. Absolutely. And, and we've got to try and get the kids today to look at that video on, on, on your website. It's, it's unbelievable. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah you know, the Drug Free World website, yeah. which the viewers can attain at drugfreeworld.org, has different courses that can be done free of charge. It actually has a classroom, a virtual classroom. Mm -hmm. So with COVID, that's very important. But the teachers, whether they be in schools or in Sunday schools or religious training, could actually access that virtual classroom and teach their kids. So exactly what you said, because what happens, let's face it, anyone selling anything is going to slant what they say in their direction. But now we're not talking about a cell phone. We're talking about a drug. Mm -hmm. And uh, most reformed uh, drug pushers, which actually comes out actually in the video that is a truth about drugs, have admitted that when they were selling drugs, they would have said whatever it took to get that buyer, whether it was young or old, to actually buy the, the drug that they were selling. That was their purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very good point you're bringing out. You know, to get the kids to sit down and, and take up one of these pamphlets and, mm -hmm. and start reading it, you know, they'll, they'll, I know, with kids, they get bored. Mm -hmm. and, and it's best that in a, in a, in a classroom setting, mm -hmm. that if, if the videos from your foundation are shown to the kids, I think they'll find it very, very interest, interesting. And it'll be an eye-opener for these kids, I'm telling you. Um, it, it's amazing because it, it's even giving me information mm -hmm. that I never was aware of. That's right. It's, it's unbelievable, I'm telling you. This is a, a fantastic thing. And you know what I have to try and do? I have to uh, try and get the neighborhood coordination offices and the various precincts here in Staten Island. I, I have to try and get them to get involved with this program. Uh -huh. Now, we were talking before we started the program that um, I can get a lot of these Booklets yes. to, to be distributed? That's to, right. To the yeah, kids? What, what happens is these, uh, these booklets that you were talking about are available and they can actually be delivered to uh, whoever solicits or downloads online at drugfreeworld.org. 
So we can definitely get those. We've done that with NYPD, uh, where we train the you know pol uh, secure school, uh, security officers mm -hmm. on drugs, and uh, gave them these booklets. There's absolutely no problem. We can actually also, uh, if they need to, run a training session. So what we could do is for those uh, different divisions, is run a training session where they could actually learn how they themselves could train others, whether it be other officers, uh, teachers, or youth, or community members, whatever. The whole idea, like you said, Joe, is uh, today, in today's world, you and I grew up in a different culture. Back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and there wasn't really so much of a prominence of a drug culture. But one of the things that's gone over in this little booklet here that's very important to realize with these youth of today is they've grown up in a totally different culture. And their culture has been one of drugs. And that drug culture has made them feel that what they have is normal around them. When we grew up, it was a different story. Mm -hmm. But now they grow up and they think, oh, come on, uh, Dad or Uncle Joe. Come on, Uncle Joe. Uh, you know, you're old fashioned. Everything has come high tech now, Uncle Joe. And, you know, you've got to come up to speed. True, true. You know, the other thing, too, you, you know, you mentioned that um, this program can be given in, in the schools. Mm -hmm. And I have some concerns because you, you want to make sure that the person at the head of the class mm -hmm. who's involved with showing the film uh -huh. believes in this program. Uh -huh. And from what I'm hearing that, the, you know, not, that's not always the case, you know, uh, it's a shame because we, we have some people that are responsible for putting our kids in the right direction. Uh -huh. They don't always put them in the right direction, you know? So we, we have to make sure that the person that's doing the class believes in this. It's so, it's so important, it's so important. Absolutely, you know, let me, let me touch on that point because the, the, the thing that's vital is for whoever is gonna be doing this program is to, for you to find out yourself. So what I would encourage them, Joe, to do is go on this site, drugfreeworld.org, and on that site, you have different courses that you can do. You have the different materials. Something that you brought out that's on that site are, are public service announcements. And there's about 16 public service announcements on each different drug. So they can watch, they're about 45 seconds to a minute. They're very impactful, very short. Once they get done just watching a few of the public service announcements, they're going to be so taken aback and impressed with the program. This is actually the largest uh, non-governmental organization educational program that's nonprofit of its kind in the world. Mm -hmm. it's, low, it's in 163 countries worldwide. Uh, I myself with a group of the America's chapter, we got it into different Caribbean countries, being born in Cuba myself, I'm fluent in Spanish and we got it into the Dominican Republic, into Haiti, Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. It's all through the US, it's in Europe, Australia, Africa, uh, really Asia, it's all over the world, Taiwan, all different languages. That's the other thing that's important to, for the viewers to know is that it's in 22 languages. The reason that's important for you to know is because you may have someone in your neighborhood of a different origin and you, know, you don't have to worry. You can still help them, go on the site, download the booklets in their language, and then just give it to them. Or you can pull up the public service announcements in their language, and then just give it to them. And let that, let that be the education that they get on their own. One thing I was gonna stress that I wanna bring out, <clears throat> don't, you know, when, when, we're, when we're talking about this, you know, sometimes we wanna do something good for someone, but we're a little too exuberant or pushy. So don't do that. Mm -hmm. Let the material <clears throat> do the talking, let them look at it, and then this way they can make up their own minds, and that by itself may get them to realize, hey, you know what? I went into this because I was so annoyed that my dad or my mom was always all over me that I got so frustrated, I didn't know what to do, I couldn't talk to anybody. So sometimes just the mere fact of you going out and listening to somebody makes a big change. Sure. I know that the foundation has partnered with the City Department of Youth Services mm -hmm. with this program, mm -hmm. but 
Has the foundation reached out to the Community Affairs Bureau of the New York City Police Department? Because in each of the patrol precincts of the city, there's a community affairs officer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's more than one community affairs mm -hmm. officer. And they come into very, very close contact with the kids in the community. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if the foundation could reach out to the Community Affairs Bureau, I'm sure they have a, a similar program in place, but uh, there's a lot here. That it, I'll be honest with you, I don't think the Community Affairs Bureau has all this information. It's amazing, isn't all it? The, the pamphlets. So uh, maybe the foundation could reach out to the chief in charge of the Community Affairs Bureau. It's uh, the new gentleman that's there now. I forget his name. Uh -huh. But um, they're at, they work out of one police plaza, and they deal with all the community affairs offices and all of the city police precincts. So maybe uh, yeah, I'd like to make that suggestion to reach out to Community yeah. Affairs. Absolutely. You know, we've worked a lot with NYPD. We've done a tremendous amount. In fact, uh, many of their members that have worked with us, we've awarded uh, in our annual Drug Free World Heroes Gala, mm -hmm. and they've spoken. We've had the DEA speak, uh, you know, at our gala. We've had uh, different, uh, you know, Senator Vela spoke at the gala, different politicians, because they all agree with you. They, they all found the same thing. And what I was going to do, actually, that I wanted to do with this point is that uh, I want to do something for you because you help the viewers out there to realize that there is something that they can do about drug uh, abuse and addiction with maybe someone they know, whatever. So this is uh, a drug-free world hat. And, you, you know, I, I, I found someone perfect to make that liaison with NYPD. Who better than someone from NYPD? So I want to actually, first of all, thank you for letting us be on your show and present this information. And secondly, I wanted to actually present to you from the Foundation for a Drug-Free World, this hat, which means that from this point forward, now you are uh, an ambassador of Drug-Free World. Here Thank you, you so much. I'm so honored. That's really nice. Look at this. Thank you. Wow. I got to make sure I hide it from the dog because she's been going after my hats. God knows sure. how many hats I've gone through. Yeah, put it on for one moment so we can get you on screen. There we go. Going to miss my hair. <laughs> there we go. You look, look? you look like either a, right. a Yankee or a Met now, right? <laughs> Thank we're you. We're ready Thank for the you game. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Wow. So, uh... But your, your point is well taken. Uh, and one thing I wanted to relate to all those watching this is that we see now that marijuana usage doesn't decrease pain. There was this theory or hypothesis that you would need less drugs after surgical treatment if you took marijuana. The truth of the matter is that hasn't been borne out by scientific studies. The truth is that you need more drugs and that the analgesics and the pain relievers that we give as, as doctors, and I as a surgeon of 40 years, don't work as well. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's also known is that when we give local uh, anesthesia, local Novocaine, mm -hmm. let's just make it a dental office, not a hospital. But obviously the same happens in a hospital. The anesthesia will not work as well. And so what happens is the person will feel more pain because of their addiction. This is not marijuana we're speaking about. We're not speaking about anything else, just the marijuana. So these are actually borne out by studies. Now, with mm -hmm. that in mind, then you wonder, is it, well, wow. So if I'm going to have more pain, what am I going to turn to? Because it hurts. I need something. And this is why you see that they turn to these other opioids and why there's been this increase in the opioid usage in many states that have either legalized medical marijuana or recreational marijuana. It's actually either one. Uh, the Surgeon General actually came out about a year or so ago and was very concerned about the fact that we may be being a little too lax on legalizing marijuana without realizing its repercussions as mm -hmm. borne out by the National Institute of Health. Yes. You know, you're talking about uh, dental surgery. I had some dental surgery not too long ago, and uh, before I left the office, they told me, go to your local drugstore, there's a prescription in case you have pain. I mm -hmm. said, okay, fine. I, I go to the drugstore, I pick it up, it's oxy. Codeine? Mm -hmm. Is that the correct? Uh, That's good. Oxyco yeah, oxyco five milligrams? Uh -huh. so I had a little pain, so I said, well, I'll take, I'll take one. And it says on the bottle, I could take up to three of them a day. I took one, and that was enough. 
I put up with the pain. Because what it did to me, just five milligrams mm -hmm. affected me. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe because I'm, I'm older now and it might have a different effect on me than a younger person. I, I don't know. But uh, what that stuff I did, for, that's it. I, I don't want it. I don't want it. You know, and, I, and I stopped using it. And I put up with the pain. The pain eventually went away. But um, these kids today don't know. They have no idea of what drugs will do to you and 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 how you if you you know and it's true when you they when they're young they start off with the marijuana mm -hmm. and then they, they reach a point in their life where man they want to get a different high now and, and right. they start graduating to other drugs mm -hmm. and and it ruins families and, uh, and it ruins their life i mean if you look at the video and, and if you look at the pictures of some of these people on the pamphlets Say, gee, look what it did to this poor girl. Well, look what it did to this poor guy. Mm -hmm. it, it ruined them. And they can't get a job. They're out of work. That's right. They lost their friends. Yeah, they lost their friends. That's right. Oh, I'll be honest with you. Um, when I first entered the uh, police department, there were friends of mine in the old neighborhood. Now I'm going mm -hmm. back to the 60s. Right. When I got appointed. Uh, I lost a few friends because sure. they decided that they wanted to use drugs, and I wanted no part of it. No. You know, so I lost a few friends, but what are you going to do? All right. Well, you brought there's a very important point you brought out uh, with youth, and that's this: is for the last probably six years now, there's been a lot of synthetic uh, fentanyl. Mm. Fentanyl, for those viewers who were out there who may not know, fentanyl is a very strong narcotic. It's actually stronger than morphine, and it's used in different patches for pain relief. This fentanyl is in pills, and what's been happening is in uh, parties, in youth parties, they have little bowls at the entrance of the party. And in these sa big salad bowls, what they do is they come in and they throw pills into the salad bowl. You, you, you already gone be before me. So what's happening is they come in and there have been parties where someone, without realizing, or maybe realizing, uh, threw fentanyl into the salad bowl. Now, you have all different youth at that party, some of them with all different histories. What happens if you take fentanyl, being such a strong narcotic, and someone who really has done really nothing in their life in terms of drug usage, they take that fentanyl thinking, well, you know, I'm at a party, yeah. and i got to fit in with my friends, right? Unfortunately, uh, the, the potency is so strong that they just die. They die. It's really, it's, it hurts wow. horrific. They just die. So it's, it's important to realize why this education is so important, like you said, because they really, do, you, you know, they don't have a clue out there. So those of you watching is you have to realize that the only way they're going to know is it's like you and I is for us to educate them, to us to empower them, because you, you can't lecture them, but you don't have to if you just happen to throw this booklet out on the den and you just throw it on the den table and maybe they see and they pick it up and you don't say anything. Or if you want to be more forthright, you can just have the public service announcement playing on your phone. And they can watch it because it's a very nice announcement. It gets to the point. You know, you mentioned about throwing it on the table in the den, but you got to get the parents involved. Yes. And in, in, unfortunately, in far too many cases, it's difficult to get the parents in, involved because they themselves are part of the drug culture growing up. So how do they lecture their kids? You know, it's uh, and especially if the if the kid knows, oh, mommy and daddy do marijuana. Mm -hmm. well, who are you talk? Why are you why are you lecturing me? Absolutely. Let, let me let me let me point out something, Joe. That is, they may not know. The viewers may not know. That's important for them to realize. And that's this: is that for those of you out there who are adults and are still having kids, or thinking of having kids, maybe you have one. Maybe you have two, maybe you think you want to have three, maybe some of you want to have four. And you may think, well, marijuana is not really a big deal. But actually what's happened is marijuana has been correlated with infant psychosis. And that psychosis, in many of these cases, is not something that's reversible. Mm -hmm. uh, I know of several instances where people that I knew were probably smoking marijuana and they had problems with their offspring, with their kids. And it's been, it's been horrible. You don't want to have a child of yours be this way for the rest of their life. And you think to yourself, 
why did I do that for the rest of your life? Because it's not reversible. Right. So this is another, another thing, again, that comes out of the National Institute of Health from Dr. Nora Volkov, which shows that in infancy and in middle childhood, that these kids who are born to parents who are using marijuana, that obviously graduates to other drugs also, are being born this way. It's, it's horrible. It's really uh, I know. I know, and, and to try and get these kids to understand what we're talking about on this program, you, you can't get through their heads, they're thick. And um, you, you know what I'd like to do? I think I mentioned this to you. Um, What's that, Joe? There's the, the neighborhood um, coordination offices out in the various uh -huh. precincts. They come into close contact with a lot of the kids. Mm -hmm. And I would really like to get the department to allow the neighborhood coordination officers to get involved with the foundation, give them all this, uh, all these pamphlets and the booklets, and you said we, we, we can get as much as we need. And I, I think what I'm going to do is uh, send a copy of the uh, DVD of this program to the borough commander out here in Staten Island, and um, this way he could see firsthand what this what this uh, foundation is all about, and maybe we could uh, get. Uh, these um, pamphlets distributed to neighborhood coordinators, and that as well, yeah. Yeah, I, what we could do is this, is to be very simple, we could let them have these uh, brochures, and inside here, uh, what happens is that they have a DVD, and they have a mm -hmm. booklet, and we can definitely get them the material. The other thing we can do is, uh, once they see it, and they can review it for themselves, we, which is something we've done, so we've trained many police officers in different countries, is we can hold a training session. And so not only could they get the material, but they probably want to make sure they know what they're doing. So we could hold one or two training sessions. Uh, and during COVID, obviously, it may have to be virtual, but this doesn't mean it can't be done. We could do it virtually. We've done that with other groups. And uh, it's definitely a great idea because this way we impact them and they in turn, like you said, impact the community. Absolutely. You know, and I just don't want to throw too much on the cop on patrol because he's got enough to do. Um, going back to when I first come on the uh -huh. job, uh, they had us inspecting construction sites, uh, giving out summonses at construction. They had us doing so much. Uh -huh. It was like it wasn't enough time in the day to do what we were, we were required to do. <laughs> but fortunately, it, times have changed and they don't have to do all that anymore. Uh, but um, they have enough to do on, they have enough on their plate. You know, I have a scanner at home and I listen to the calls coming over, going to the... Uh, They're busy second. guys, right? But let me they say... They don't have one, enough time to blow their nose. I mean, this is unbelievable. They're, they're, they're busy guys, important people in our, in our community. But let me say one thing for them, though, which is important why it would behoove them to make some time for this, is 90% of shootings, the shooters on drugs. So 90%, so imagine... If we decrease drug use, if 90% of the shootings are due to drug use and we decrease that, imagine what that means for police safety. Sure, absolutely. Uh, amazing. So, to, you know, yeah. it's like sometimes there's things in my office, you know, at the end of the day and I'm tired and I really don't want to do it, but I realize I have to do it, do a good job and for my own security and, and to do, be competent. So, you know what? Uh, I have a lot of friends in my office who are policemen, uh, Bob. Is, is one's been with me for many years with his wife. And you know what? It behooves us in our community to make it safer because violence goes down, rape goes down, crime goes down, and then we have a community where we have people who can help each other. You know, we're getting to the uh, end of the program, uh, but uh, we're going to be back again. Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching, and I want to thank you for coming on the program, and thank you for the hat and and the honor that you bestowed upon me, I really appreciate no it. No problem. You are now a drug-free world ambassador for New York and Staten Island. I accept. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for watching the program. Uh, all of you, you take care. And uh, God bless, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>